All right, today we are talking about millwork and casework for interior design. What exactly is millwork? It's a really broad term. It refers to any woodwork made from a mill. So all millwork items come from raw lumber. It's turned into many different types of wood pieces for both architectural as well as interior uses. So just to give you a little background on millwork, uh, the golden era for millwork was really between 1880 and 1910, though millwork definitely happened before then, especially um, obviously in Europe and places like that. But here in America, our golden era was 1880 to 1910. The Industrial Revolution is what brought us a lot of large machines and even cheap labor, which brought faster and more efficient ways to harvest lumber and how to turn it into workable wood for both interiors and architecture. So I'll start with Victorian millwork. This is really the pinnacle of British woodworking. It's uh, It gives houses a very elegant look. Think of the grand ceilings and extremely intricate millwork moldings and archways you can see in this picture that uh, that looks like a very rich sophisticated house. So that is Victorian millwork. Craftsman houses also originated in Britain but they're very different from Victorian. They're very simple very earthy interiors as well as exteriors. You can even see there's not a whole lot of fancy stuff going on with this particular house. Uh, the house design relies mainly on wood with um, open beams, a lot of wood trim, um, but simple, earthy, easy to look at. The colonial revival, I always kind of feel like it's a blend of different things. Uh, it's a classic American architecture style. It encompasses English and Dutch, a little Spanish colonial. Um, very simple woodwork, but also embraces queen and furniture, which is very elegant, kind of organic, um, intricate pieces. So you can kind of see from the interior as well as the exterior the type of house that we're looking at. It looks simple, but sometimes there are some very intricate woodworking pieces involved. The prairie technique is something that became famous uh, in Chicago in the 1900s. It's kind of like a blend between Midwestern and Japanese influences. You can see it's extremely simple, probably the most simple that we've seen so far. Very open and spacious, um, but they also use a lot of wood banding and horizontal facades. So it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but there is uh, some wood facade on the wall on the right, but you can definitely see it in the picture below on the outside of the house where they have that beautiful wall that's purely wood and how that works so well with the stonework. The Spanish Revival was popular between 1915 and 1931. It came about during the Panama, California expansion. A lot of Spanish and Mediterranean influences. Definitely wood beams are part of that. Wood ceilings can be part of that. Uh, and then some minor trim here and there. Um, it's really kind of blending in a lot of tile work along with the wood as well. So let's talk a little bit about the common uses of interior design and millwork. This is where we start doing built-in cabinets and shelves like the picture on the left. That is where people usually think of millwork uh, when they hear the word, but now we're starting to get into more areas with that. Uh, after COVID, a lot of homes need to have uh, offices built in for them. So you can see that this is custom built. This is not something that you can just order off of Amazon. Somebody has to design this. They have to design the patterns in the doors, which uh, hardware and pulls each door and door are going to have, where the shelves are located, how high are they, how deep are they. Uh, this is all the work of an interior designer and this is something that you will be doing for certain um, as you move forward into your career. Other common uses of interior millwork include columns, we have beams, a lot of different types of moldings, be it on the ceiling or around doors and windows. Uh, we also have handrails, as you can see in that picture with the stairs. 
a lot of different uh, looks and shapes and sizes that you can work with, how far out they protrude, um, you know, different types of designs and looks. Uh, it's really kind of a fun thing to work with. The sky's the limit in terms of how you're designing with these pieces. Common uses of interior millwork. I'm continuing on. I don't know why I have <laughs> the columns in the same staircase from the previous one on this slide, but I do want you to take a look at that restaurant and bar. Wow, that is quite a designed space. Now, millwork doesn't typically include furniture, so the tables and chairs don't really count, but look at that bar top. Look at the back bar. Uh, somebody has to design all that, so um, it's a pretty intricately done space. Even the beams in the ceiling, there's columns, like all of that has to be designed by a designer. We also use shiplap. Uh, that's been a pretty popular option for many people in residential where we're using horizontal pieces of wood and we're stacking them on top of each other. And basically it goes from floor to ceiling. Wood paneling consists of flat pieces of wood surrounded by wood trim that kind of places it together like a puzzle piece. As you can see on the photo on the right, uh, we have little square panels that are um, put together with some wood molding in between. So we don't just always concentrate on the interior. Sometimes us designers are also involved on the exterior. And in terms of millwork, we can have things like pergolas, which are a very ornamental type of look. It's not really meant to keep sun or weather off of you when you're sitting underneath it, but it's definitely a decorative, beautiful piece. It originates from the Asian cultures. Uh, you can definitely see that this one particularly has a Japanese influence to it. On the right side, you see railings, so balconies and stairs, they still need to have railings and they still need to be designed by somebody. So might as well be us, right? Exteriors can still have columns and posts. So balconies, um, here this is a patio, uh, all types of different houses can get all different types of columns and posts. And then we have the cupolas that you see over on the right hand side. I always kind of feel like this is like a lighthouse lookout. Um, like there's gonna be this big beam of light coming out of here, but some homes have this little thing so that you can kind of get a peek at the neighborhood, see what's going on in the weather. As you can see, this one in particular is designed completely with wood and they typically also have that pointed roof that you see in the picture. Obviously homes can have shutters. There's all different types of trims and moldings depending on what style your house is in. They can be decorative. They can go around windows and doors. Um, they can even help provide a little bit of shade um, like that bottom picture on the right. Um, that just helps kind of scatter light a little bit differently at the window versus having it come directly in. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between millwork and casework because they are actually different, although a lot of people do interchange the names. I think many of you have probably heard me refer to millwork and casework as the same, um, but there are differences between them. So millwork is usually finished building products that are made from a mill. So a mill is the people who are going to put the decoration on the baseboards. They're the ones who are cutting them into the size stri uh, strips that they need to be. Um, and usually what we do is um, they get built into a pre-existing space. So they might get made at a mill, but then they're shipped to the home and a carpenter is the one who cuts them up and puts them into the space. So this is things like display counters, your doors and the trim that goes around them. Um, I say custom kitchen cabinets because typically cabinets are casework, but if you have cabinets that require like a carpenter to actually build it while they're in the space, that can technically go under millwork. Crown molding that you see around the edges of cabinets or even up on the ceiling, that is also considered millwork. Millwork does not include wood flooring, um, it does not include building siding, and it does not include all wood ceilings. I think if you do have some trim pieces up there, that could be considered. But typically, if you have a ceiling that's 100% uh, wood, there's nothing to it that's not necessarily considered millwork. The primary purpose of millwork really is to be more ornamental, and it also aids custom installations. 
These are things that are not easily replicated. It's not something that a machine can just cut the parts for and put together. This is something that a carpenter has to work with the wood, change the wood, install the wood in a specific way. Now casework involves manufacturing any boxed furniture. So this is your racks, your storage spaces, you know, kind of like your pantries and things like that in the kitchen, your cabinetry, any kind of drawers. So I have kitchen drawers, but think about like the drawers that you have in your bedrooms or in your living rooms, um, bookcases, very boxy, boxed furniture. This does not include custom made furniture. So things like tables and chairs, desks, the, those kind of things, that's not typically considered casework. That's a whole other entity. Some of that could be considered millwork, um, like a custom desk that a carpenter has to build in a home office. I would consider that more millwork. Now the primary purpose of casework is to be modular. So it's built somewhere and then it's shipped and you can move it around. Now you can build in cabinetry, um, you know, you attach it to the floor or to the wall and that becomes built in, but there can be modular pieces like books, bookshelves and things like that. Uh, typically casework is much easier to mass produce and replicate. So that's why kitchen cabinets are a great example. These manufacturing companies can replicate several types of kitchen cabinets. They do it easily. They put them together. Um, it's kind of like it has a formula, whereas millwork, eh, there's a little bit more involved into how that's put together. This is just a real quick uh, comparison of millwork versus casework. One of the things I want to point out is just cost. It is very costly to include millwork into a project because usually you got the time and labor of the carpenter. You've got special materials. You have to get the special tools. It can be really costly. Whereas with casework, you typically a manufacturer is working with it. The costs tend to be a little bit lower. I guess it depends on what you're purchasing as casework. Shop drawings. So these are sets of detailed plans, kind of similar to what your construction document sets are, but it's really focused on the millwork pieces themselves. So they're typically comprising of plans, elevations, and cross sections, uh, and often are produced by the millwork supplier and are submitted to architects or designers for approval. The drawings need to be really detailed and show the actual construction of the finished project. So we're not actually like just saying, hey, this is a oak cabinet. No, we got to get a lot more detail than that. A carpenter needs to know how to put it together. So as you can see with the picture on the right, we're showing all the different types of woods. We're showing how the wood pieces go together. We're showing all the support pieces that are needed and we're also showing some of the dimensions and call outs. Now it's not just that a millwork supplier is the people who do these shop drawings. Oftentimes as interior designers, um, we work with a lot of people who do millwork or casework and we can submit space measurements and conceptual ideas to manufacturers and then based on that the manufacturer is the one who comes up with the shop drawings or the way that it's actually going to be put together and then they give it back to us for our approval. That's kind of called outsourcing. So when you don't have the time, resources, or money to actually do the shop drawings, you can find manufacturers who will do it for you. So I've seen interior designers do it both ways and there's pluses and minuses to both ways, but definitely understanding that there is going to be a relationship between you as the designer and to the millwork supplier, as well as the carpenter who's actually going to be building it together. Now each shop typically has their own manufacturing standards. So shop drawings can differ in look and information. They can differ in how they're putting the wood together. They can differ in what kinds of woods and the sizes of things. So it really just kind of depends on who completes them, but just understand that each, each place is going to have their own way of doing it. Now if the piece needs specific hardware like hinges, the shop drawings can show how the unit opens, how it closes, how it moves, and how it functions. So for instance, um, if there's a special way that a cabinet or a millwork 
or casework piece has to open, like maybe it's from, it opens to the top instead of pulling out, like that's something that might be important to have some extra shop drawings just to show the movement of those pieces. So moving on, typically the types of drawings that we have include elevations. We're not just elevating the front anymore. Now we're really kind of paying attention to the piece as a whole. We have to do elevations of the front, the back, the left side, the right side, as well as a top view. Because think about it, if you were a carpenter trying to make this, wouldn't you want to see all of those sides and understand what this is supposed to look like when you're done making it. Um, a lot of these custom pieces, as you can see in the orthographic drawings and the models, oftentimes have different features on different parts and different sides of the piece that you're working on. So it's really important to capture the piece on all sides. And elevations are a perfect way to visually communicate what's going on with that millwork piece. Uh, we can also include cross sections to show construction quality and materials. So again, it's about what pieces are going together and how they're going together. And then what's really great about the time that we're in right now is technology is allowing for 3D models to be included. And that just really, again, helps the communication process. So perspectives or orthographic views are oftentimes included with shop drawings these days. Um, I do want to kind of point out this example studio. Um, they have some really interesting uh, projects that they're working on. Millwork and casework don't have to just be all wood. There's lots of different ways to fabricate. I mean, we have 3D printing now. We have resins that we can work with, acrylics, um, laser cutting, vacuum forming sheet metals. Gosh, there's all kinds of things that we can do. So I highly recommend you visit www.bridgewaterstudio.net and check out some of the projects that they're working on. You can really get inspired by a lot of the things that they're doing. So let's talk about things to consider when designing for a millwork or a casework project. There are things that each designer needs to be aware of. So the first thing you want to consider is materials. What materials do I want to put this particular piece together with? And what are the different wood types? And what are the additional materials that I can add to it to just kind of make it special and unique or even function the way that I want it to? There's how the pieces come together. So there's all different types of ways that we can cut wood or staple them or nail them. Um, together, glue them together, um, put them together like puzzle pieces. The joinery is really important. We want to make sure that our pieces are sturdy and safe, that they're going to hold the weight that they need to hold. And the joinery is really a big part of that. Then you have to think about, okay, how is this going to be finished? Because normally if we have wood that is unfinished, it's very vulnerable to outside issues like UV rays, weather, water, you guys often hear me talk about chicken juices spilling off your counter onto your cabinets. You don't want things to penetrate the wood that could potentially alter or damage the wood. So finishing it with um, stains or paints, varnishes, um, there's a lot of different things that you can use on top of the surface in order to keep that protected. Then you also have to think about installation. Is this something that needs to get bolted to the floor, attached to the wall? Is it going to hang from the ceiling? You've really got to be able to communicate um, all those aspects that go into installation. What kind of tools do we need? What kind of um, brads do we need? Screws, nuts, bolts, all that kind of stuff needs to be considered. Um, we're going to take a quick look at some of the PDFs available on Canvas. So with the magic of video editing, I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, so the first resource that I want to share with you is the Fundamentals of Wood Construction. Wow, this is a really powerful resource for you to have, especially if you are new to working with wood. Um, it goes through quite a bit of information, like all the different types of woods, how we work with woods, how do we get them ready to be used in projects, 
how we put them together and all kinds of information. So I'm just going to briefly go through this. If you want to know all the different types of woods that are listed here on the left in this table, you can see where they're located. So if you're really trying to be sustainable and want to use local woods, this will help you kind of know where these woods typically come from. How we use them typically, um, cat, like for instance, birch can be used in cabinet work, imitation mahogany furniture, wood dowels, all kinds of stuff. And then it also talks about the characteristics of the wood. Is it a hardwood? Is it a softwood? Is it a fine grain, open grain, closed grain? Talks a lot about the color and just the physical attributes of each wood. So there's all kinds of you of those to work with. Some of them are used more often than others. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons. So definitely look at this. That's a really great resource to have. This one talks about the different types of defects and blemishes, which comes in handy when we start talking about grades of wood and types of wood. Sometimes we don't want any kind of defect or blemish, and sometimes we do for that rustic look, you know? It's good to understand the names of these defects and blemishes and what they are so that you can kind of talk the lingo a little bit. Really, woods can be classified into two categories. They're either a softwood or a hardwood. A softwoods are typically pines. Um, almost all of your pines are going to be soft, and there's even some pines that are so soft that you can take your fingernail and press into the wood, and it'll actually indent the wood. Whereas if you try to do that with like an oak or a walnut, there's no way that your fingernail will ever affect that wood. So it's good to know that we don't typically do cabinetry with pine because those cabinet trees are usually getting beat up pretty good. Think about all the activities that you have in your kitchen. So usually we have hardwoods being used in your casework. Not always, but usually. Then we're talking about grading. So this is where, and we're going to really go over this when we do our field trip to Home Depot, but uh, this is where you understand the different qualities of woods. So like I said, some woods come with blemishes. So they're typically categorized as a lower quality, whereas a piece of wood that doesn't have any blemishes is usually what you want to use like on the front face of a cabinet, for instance. They're really beautiful. They look good. Um, they're put together well. Um, there's a lot of kind of information about that. So this information that you see in this table kind of helps you understand the differences between those, as does this table as well. So there's different grades and there's also different numbers. It's really important to understand the difference between nominal size as well as dress size. So typically we talk about two by fours, right? Like right here, two by four. Are they really two inches by four inches? No, they are not. Um, actually, if you measure it with a measuring tape, you'll find that a two by four actually measures as one and a half by three and a half inches. So as designers, it's really important to understand the difference between the two. And it might even be beneficial if you're going to do a custom piece to actually use the dress size instead of the nominal size. But we'll talk about that during this next module. There are engineered wood products, which um, can involve things like plastics or resins. They just help make things stronger or just give different characteristics to pieces like laminated veneers, a lot of laminations, I-beams, glue laminations. There's all kinds of things, and we'll definitely talk about that when we go to Home Depot as well. And just kind of scrolling down, like understanding how plywood is actually put together. This is what makes it so strong is that the grains of the wood are going in opposite directions on each ply. And again, there's different grades for even plywood. And here are kind of like the classifications of softwood, plywood rates, species and strengths and stiffness. So you can really see the differences between the groups and which wood goes to which group. This is a stamp that you typically see on lumber, even in Home Depot or Lowe's or stores like that. And there's all kinds of information as to how to read it and understand it. So this kind of goes with that as well. 
And I'm just scrolling down because what I want to do is kind of get into some of this area where we talk about why we work with wood. We want to ensure that we have 90 degree angles to work with. And that has a lot to do with planing and edging wood, especially raw lumber to get it into a workable piece that we use in millwork and cabinetry. Uh, joints, uh, that is also the next really important aspect. You want to have wood form tight and strong joints so that they can uphold the weight and the work that is necessary with them. There are simple joints like butt joints, lap joints, and miter joints, but then there's more complicated or complex joints that actually involve us cutting out wood or doing things like that. So dovetail joints, dado joints, um, I'm going to show you what those look like right here. These are some of the more simple um, aspects. So a plain butt is when two pieces of wood just are put together. Uh, there's a tongue and groove and a dowel and a spline. So you can see that we're kind of cutting into the wood or drilling into the wood. And it's like puzzle pieces going into each other. That just kind of helps the wood stay together and then we usually put glue in these joints when um, they're here. There are lap joints where you can see where part of the wood is taken away on one section and part of the wood is taken away on the other and then they kind of come together to form a joint. Miter joints are like your picture frames where you cut at a 45 degree angle and then you butt the two pieces together. You can use a biscuit, you can use a nail, staple gun. There's a lot of different ways to kind of attach the woods together, but oftentimes these are also glued together. But glue alone is not enough to make these pieces stick together. Otherwise, it, you'll find that this joint becomes very weak. There has to be something that penetrates the wood on both sides in order to make it work together. The ones I wanted to show you are these. So this is a dado joint where we take a saw and we actually cut out a part of the wood and that way another piece of wood can fit inside of that little trough. And then a rabbit joint is essentially the same as a dado joint. It's just on the edge instead of in the middle of the wood. So you can see here it's on the edge and then the pieces kind of fit together that way. So lots of different ways to join woods together and we'll try to talk about that as we move into this next phase like which joints are better for which areas. All kinds of ways to secure things. Even here is a stub and a haunched and a table haunched where you can see that this, these pieces are cut in a specific way that fit inside of these little slots. And here is somebody actually showing you, we lower the saw blades so that we can make those kind of cuts. And you got to be really careful and really aware when you're working with saws in this way. And then the last one I just want to show you is the dovetail joint. This is what happens in a lot of cabinetry, especially high-end cabinetry. There's special machines that can cut these fairly easily, but they look like little fingers going together. But they call that a dovetail because it's typically a triangular piece and then they fit inside of each other like a puzzle. And it's really hard to get those uh, joints separated once they've been joined together. And as you go through uh, this, you'll see more and more information, the different types of moldings and trims. Um, these are the profiles. That's what we call that when we kind of slice through a trim. Um, there's probably hundreds of thousands of different moldings and trims that you can use in terms of their silhouette, uh, which is kind of fun. There's different types of nails that you can use. So brads are typically what are used more in millwork because they're smaller and finer, but you can really use any of these. And they come with all kinds of information. Like I said, this is a really great resource. You can see information about staples and screws if you need to, what sizes they come in, what kind of holes that we can drill. Um, like a countersink hole is one where the whole screw goes into the wood or is flush with the wood so that it's not sticking on top of the wood. Just kind of going through bolts and all kinds of fasteners. Like if you really want to know something, it's probably in this resource. So this one's really great. The second one I want to show you is a real good basic understanding of cabinet materials and construction. So here it's going to talk about all the parts and pieces. 
Usually solid wood on a cabinet is what is on the face front and it's usually some other kind of board um, that goes uh, on the sides and the backs. Cheaper, stronger, more efficient kind of things like particle board, plywood, even MDF. What different types of other materials can be on cabinets like laminates or melamines. Construction methods, so here's kind of outlining dovetailed a little bit more detailed. There's mortise and tenon. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of that. That's that kind of joinery. Here's that dado again, which is very common in uh, cabinetry making. The rabbit, where it's on the end. We got dowels. We got butt joints. All kinds of stuff. Here's talking about cabinet boxes and face frames. Here it's talking about drawers, doors, shelves. All of these need to have some specific information. So two really great resources for you to use as you move forward onto your specialized projects. And I just wanted to kind of go through them and share them with you so that you know that you've got something really special. Please save these and keep these for future use. All right, let's move on. Let's look at a couple millwork examples. So here we have a really interesting room. Uh, remember that tables and chairs don't really count, but we have lots of wood on the walls. We have this really interesting, I guess it's kind of like a, a system where you can have these like maybe movable shelves that you can put things on. It looks like maybe they have candles on there just for some additional lighting, but there's a lot of paneled. And then we have this really beautiful intricately designed, um, it looks like a wine rack because you can see the wines in here, but uh, wow, that's pretty fancy. Somebody has to design that and somebody has to put it together. So imagine the amount of drawings and details and work that goes into something like that. Now wood does not have to just be square pieces and they don't have to just be cut out. There's lots of ways to work with wood. In this piece you can see that they, they're actually bending the wood um, and that is wood. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that we can do that through steam and heat. Uh, so don't feel like you have to just make things boxy. You can have some fun with it and you can create interesting patterns like this basket weave on this, this particular credenza. But we can also do lots of it with in space too. It doesn't have to just be furniture. Uh, space can really focus on woodwork, how we're paneling it, how we're using it as rails on the floor, on the ceiling. And then, you know, we can also curve it. it. Again, it doesn't have to be boxy. We can have some fun with it. So don't let the fact that wood seems to be hard and unpliable keep you from doing some fun and beautiful things with it. Uh, High-end residential as well as restaurants, a lot of times they need to have wine cellars. Sometimes they're on public view and sometimes they're not. But as you can see in this picture, man, somebody really designed this room well with millwork. We've got ceilings, we've got columns, we've got arches, and we've got those intricate little storage areas for all those wines. Man, this, this would probably bring you quite a bit of money as a designer, so have some fun with it. Don't be afraid to get crazy with it. I love out of the box design. I think that's what we're all here for. We're not here to, to make plain Jane kind of stuff. We want fancy like this desk. Look at that. Look how molded and curved that looks. Maybe you're taking a single piece of wood that somebody has on their property and you're fashioning it into a, a really contemporary looking desk. Wow. We can sculpt with it. We can do things with it. You don't have to just stick with putting them together with nails and glue. On the other hand, we also have opportunities to to use nails and glues to create configurations like you see in the picture on the right. That's a very specific, um, I don't know, I know a few gamers who would probably like that, but if you need some privacy or something, a lot of offices are doing pods just to help people feel more safe and secure in their work area. So kind of an interesting piece. But that's really all I have for millwork for you guys. Just understand that there's all different types of woods. There's things that you need to understand about how to put wood together, how we finish it to make it look beautiful, but also keep the wood la lasting a long time. And then there's also things that we need to consider about installation. There's lots of history and era that we can pull from. But there's also a lot of things that we can do with wood. So I'm excited to get you guys started in millwork. I think we're going to have a lot of fun in this module.